Good evening, everyone. We'd like to get started. First of all, thank you for coming out and joining us tonight. I know it is difficult to get out this time of night and this time of year. Um, but we have with us this evening Lane Winnegar from Effective School Solutions. And she is going to talk to us about supporting students through the experience of stress, excessive worry, and the impact on their mental health. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Just to sort of echo Meg's sentiments, I do appreciate it. I know that it is so hard when it's, you know, dark at 5 o'clock, and it feels like once you get in the house, you just want to, you know, put on your jammies and call it a night. So the fact that you are here really just um, really tells me how much you care about your kids and supporting them through these kinds of things. So thank you for being here. So again, my name is Lady Whitaker, and we're talking about supporting students to stress, excessive worry, and mental health tonight. Um, so just in case you're not familiar with who ESS is, ESS partners with school districts to help them implement culturally inclusive mental health behavioral support programs that improve care, strengthen outcomes, address trauma, and maintain students in their home district. So our little housekeeping to, for tonight, uh, materials today are presented uh, from the National Trial Traumatic Stress Network, Child uh, Centers for Disease Control, Child Mind Institute, UNICEF, and of course, Effective School Solutions. So today we'll talk first a little bit about our stress response, fears, excessive worry, and anxiety. Then we're going to give through eight tips on managing current uh, uh, stressors, helping children cope, uh, supporting children with existing mental health challenges, resetting, and then we'll, uh, some resources that you can turn to. So first I want to talk about the human stress response, with, with the root of anxiety in the first place, right? So with uh, our stress response, that is the human experience. Uh, you know, millions of years ago, when we were uh, cavemen, we had this, um, you know, mostly it was physical threats. If there was a physical threat, if there was a saber-toothed tiger there, our innate system would jump into high gear and say, oh, we have to protect ourselves from this threat. So we would produce high amounts of cortisol and adrenaline, our stress hormones, to sort of help us through those times. And then over millions of years, that has evolved to now looking for emotional threats as well. So again, the stress response is our survival strategy. It is just part of the human condition. When we are faced with something that feels insurmountable or overwhelming, we go into our stress response. It is important to note that there are three parts of our brain, the triune brain theory, and in that, you have first our brain stem, which is that most prehistoric part of our brain. That's the part of our brain that is really just concerned with respiration and voluntary, um, involuntary things like breathing, our, our heart rate, our reproductive system, things that you don't even think about. And then we have that middle brain. And that middle brain is the most satiated, most happy when it feels connected, when we feel that we have bonds to uh, society and to each other, that we are essentially pack animals. Hi, welcome, come on in. You haven't missed a thing, come right on in. And then finally, the last part of our brain to develop is our uh, their neocortex or the prefrontal cortex often known as our executive functioning part of our brain. And that's the last part to develop, closer to 25 for a woman and closer to 30 for a man. So when we're in that human stress response, we have that middle brain that I've referred to has something called your amygdala. And that amygdala is constantly scanning, surveying, looking for things that could be causing, again, that physical or emotional uh, stressors, right? Or things that we should be fearing of, right? So when that amygdala gets activated, that sends a, a, an alarm to your brain that says quickly, make cortisol, make adrenaline, and then send that out to the body. Now, this is important too because the hippocampus is affected, and when we talk about students in school, our hippocampus is most uh, used for learning and memory, which is why sometimes when we feel really stressed out, it's hard to remember things. Have you ever been stressed out and then realized my glasses were on my head this whole time? or I just had my car keys, what happened to them, right? We start to get forgetful. Um, memory goes right through and down when we feel in these stressful situations. So then again, that have that alarm in, that amygdala, in the amygdala, tells the brain start making stress hormones, start making that cortisol adrenaline, and start pumping it out to the body. And so when that happens, we can have changes in all parts of our body in order for us to make that cortisol and adrenaline. We think about you know, a mother rescuing their child from under uh, a car, right? That they have that superhuman strength. 
Well, that strength is only able to um, be mustered up by the human body if we sacrifice some other things. So in order to do that, we might shut down, oh please, no welcome, come on in. In order to do that, we might first shut down our digestive system. We might shut down our reproductive system. We might shut down our immune system or any of our systems that aren't useful in that moment to protect us from what that perceived fear or what we are anxious about. And by the way, please feel free to interrupt at any time, or I should say interject, if you have any questions, comments, anecdotes, I'd love to hear them. So when we think about some of the effects, and we'll talk about how, you, how this manifests into the behavior that you might be seeing from your kids when they're experiencing excessive worry. But when we think about that, if we're shutting down some of those systems, then we may have some hormonal issues that have some mood changes, right? We may have our normal happy kid suddenly is, has some, some real irritable moods. We may have, um, you know, decreased uh, bone density, our, our brain function, brain fog, uh, less able to concentrate because of that surging of, um, of, of stress hormones, of cortisol and adrenaline. You might have that heart rate elevation. When we're stressed out, when you feel anxious, you feel your heartbeat. We may have changes in our thought patterns. Uh, a lot of kids who talk about excessive worry and, and you know, their fears, it's rapid thoughts just rapid thoughts that are just coming at you into such quick succession that it feels overwhelming that I can't keep up with how quickly the thoughts are coming. Um, and then, you know, in order to do that, we shut down our digestive system. So this is why a lot of times we feel those tummy aches, right? When you have a kid that says, I don't know what's going on, but my tummy really hurts or I have a headache. A lot of this is caused by those uh, hormonal changes that are caused by the, the cortisol and adrenaline. So then that's gonna put us in our fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. We don't talk about fawn as much, but when we're fawning in our stress response, that's when we tend to be really agreeable, we wanna become a caretaker, we wanna fix things, uh, you know, and, and that sounds like a good thing, right? But we still need to recognize that kids are in their stress response when that's happening. And so, um, you know, what tends to happen for those kids as they get older is, not so good at setting boundaries, not very good at saying no to things, um, oftentimes become people pleasers, and that can have some you know, disastrous consequences as well. So consider this when you see your kids behaving in ways that are, you know, are odd to you or don't seem like they fit the, uh, the scenario that you're in that emotions that will likely trigger the stress response are often not the thing that we see, right? It's not the, the crying or it's not the anger. They're usually triggered by one of these deeper emotions, some type of a fear, anxiety, frustration, confusion, hurt, guilt, shame. This is the real emotion and then it manifests in our fight, flight, or freeze response, right? Does that make sense what I'm saying to everyone? That the real primary emotion can, and this is not even an exhaustive list that you're seeing here, when we talk about rejection, depression, think about how many opportunities there are for a child to feel that through a day um, with their peers in the school setting at home. Uh, and when we feel some of these emotions, it can certainly trigger that stress response. That feels like emotional threat. So when we talk about fears, excessive worry, anxiety, this is kind of broken down by age group to help us understand what some of that may look like. So when we think about preschool, there may be increased fear of being alone. There may be more bad dreams or waking up in the middle of the night. You may see bedwetting, changes in appetite, increase in temper tantrums, whining. So think about what I've just shared about the stress response and then put that in the mind of a little person, right? And so as we're experiencing that fight, flight, or freeze, it comes out in the form of a tantrum for a little person, right? That I'm just so frustrated, I don't know what to do. It's just this volcano of emotion coming out, right? Um, Remember we talked about the hormonal system can often be um, you know, impacted by all that cortisol and adrenaline. That can cause hormonal changes that disrupt my sleep patterns. Hence why you may see that frequent waking up, um, bedwetting, changes in appetite. Remember I talked about our digestive system often, often shuts down when we're feeling a lot of cortisol and adrenaline or the stress hormones. So who's been stressed out? You feel like eating sometimes at the height of your stress. Some of us do, and some of us it's the last thing I wanna do. For me, I, um, you know I'm not doing well if I'm super skinny, right? <laughs> that I am um, not able to really eat well when I'm feeling really stressed out. I worked with teen moms for a long time, 
And I can't tell you how often we would have this beautiful spread for our teen moms, um, Belgian waffles and beautiful things for breakfast. And oftentimes they weren't able to enjoy it or partake in it because they were too stressed out in the morning. They came to school with a lot of anxiety already. Anyone here have some anxiety or even mild in the morning? It's hard to eat when you've got, I see you smiling, right? Do I have anyone here who's like on the smoothie plan or just coffee till like one o'clock, right? That for a lot of us, that's really hard to eat. Well, so, so think about that. Now I'm in my school day and I haven't eaten. Now it's 10, 11 o'clock. I may have been up since 6, 7 a.m., right? And now I'm probably gonna get a little cranky. My blood sugar's dropping. You're gonna see some behavior changes. Um, and so this is why it's good to be curious about the behaviors that we see rather than to be just irritated and want it to go away, right? To ask questions. Well, why are you irritated? When is the last time you ate? Why weren't you hungry this morning? Or I noticed you're eating a lot more. Is this a gross bird? Is something going on? This is a good time to be curious about some of these changes. So then when we move on to ages uh, 6 to 12, more of our elementary ages, then we, you know, some of these things persist. We've got some irritability, whining, maybe more aggressive behaviors. So as we talked about that fight, flight, or freeze response, this may be more of that fight response, right? That some of us are just predisposed to when we feel that surge of stress, uh, that adrenaline and cortisol comes on. Some of us are more predisposed to go into our fight mode. Some are more into to freeze. Some are more into fawning. And others are into flight, right? And so we can also vacillate between all of those. It's very easy to, you're not, uh, you may be predisposed or more likely to start off with one, but you can easily vacillate to another one of those stress responses. So then we've got um, headaches, stomach aches. As I started to mention, when you're feeling really stressed out, you may feel like those butterflies in your stomach. Our stomach is often referred to as our second brain because there's just as many nerve endings in our stomach as there are in our, in our base of our spine. So all of those nerve endings feel our feelings. Think about when you feel really happy or excited, we feel it in our gut. Think about when we see someone that we love and we feel that, right? Or if we've got that puppy love, that honeymoon phase and you feel that butterflies, that good feeling in your belly, but we feel so many emotions in our gut. So it's important to note that sometimes when our kids tell us, you know, I've got a tummy ache, and then the more that you're there with them and present and helping calm whatever fear and anxiety they have, you may start to see those symptoms disappear. And oftentimes, I think school nurses get uh, fooled by this one and parents at home too, like, oh, see, there's nothing wrong with this kid. We sat here and talked for a couple minutes and right, we've seen this, and that stomach ache went away. Suddenly you don't seem like you have a headache. We've been laughing and talking. But I hope that it occurs to you that you may have been able to um, relieve them of, of that feeling of anxiety which immediately allows for those symptoms to dissipate, right? That now I feel safe, and now in this safety, my stomach's not hurting anymore. And now that I have this safety, my headache has gone away. So it's not that these ailments weren't real to begin with or they didn't exist. We just have to understand that sometimes you can provide that safety for kids, or for your child in particular, so that they no longer feel that surge of, am I gonna be okay, right? So then moving on to adolescence, or ages 13 to about 18 now, like in that high school age, right? Middle school, high school. So physical symptoms again, right? Rashes. This might surprise you. When we're, well, I, you know, if I go back a little bit, we talked about skin changes, right? So when we've got all of this adrenaline and cortisol pumping through us, you may start to feel, in there like a reaction with histamines and things, and you may get what we call anxiety rashes. Sometimes it may actually come up in the form of a real hive or something, and sometimes you just feel itchy. But these are also symptoms of stress. I mean, of course, if you are concerned about a real allergic reaction, you should definitely seek medical attention. But be aware that if this is something that's persistent, or that when people get stressed out, you start noticing that they're a little more itchy than usual. Um, I had to kind of be aware of that for myself. I never thought about that as a symptom of anxiety. But that sort of itchiness can definitely play a role as, again, it's part of those body-wide changes when our bodies are filled with cortisol and adrenaline. So then we've got agitation, decrease in energy, apathy, ignoring health promotion behaviors, isolating from peers and loved ones. Because sometimes it's hard to be in the presence of others when your thoughts, you're just wrapped up in your thoughts. 
it's hard to enjoy your company or to even be present with you when I'm so lost in my thoughts. So sometimes it's easier just to isolate myself and deal with what's going on there. Is that familiar? I see a few people nodding their heads. We may feel that way ourselves. When we're just overwhelmed. It's just hard to be around people sometimes. Sometimes that's when we need to be connected with people the most. Um, so that's also when you start to have concerns about stigmas and injustices and is it okay to talk about these feelings that I have. Uh, you know, a lot of kids don't even identify these symptoms as anxiety. A lot of people don't know they have anxiety until they've been officially di diagnosed, right? So it's not something that we, uh, you know, we maybe feel that butterflies in your stomach, but if a child is used to that feeling, they might not recognize that as something abnormal. Oh, I mean, when I when I found out I had anxiety, I was like, not everybody doesn't wake up like that. That's not normal for people to just sort of wake up on the edge already. Um, but for a lot of us, and by the way, anxiety has just been on the rise for a long time, even pre-pandemic. This generation, um, you know, is one of those uh, one of these generations that is suffering from anxiety the most. And now, there's a couple things that could be uh, to blame for that. We've got social media at high levels. We've also just got more to do. I think we're all more stressed out nowadays. We didn't have email 30 years ago, right? You know, we wake up now, the first thing we're doing is checking our emails. You might hear them come through in the middle of the night. Kids are no different. Kids early now are getting emails and, and checking and having to keep up with things in real time. And it's stressful. And we weren't doing that many decades ago, right? So this is new technology, which in some ways has created a lot of convenience and support in a lot of ways but it's also created more anxiety. Now, you know, we can find people right away. <laughs> we can interrupt whatever you're doing with constant communication. And it does create more anxiety than we've had in past generations. So now, eight tips on managing this stress. Before I move on to those tips, though, does anyone have any questions about the ways that the cortisol and adrenaline causes these, these changes in our behavior and our mood, uh, physiological changes? Anyone? Okay. So let's get to our eight tips. So the first is to remain calm. Do we remember when our kids were little and they may fall down and you, you know, they're looking at your reaction before they have a reaction. They look to you and they're like, oh, am I okay? I'm laying down or all this stuff fell on me, am I all right? And based on your reaction is how they react. If you go, oh my God, the baby fell then usually you're gonna see a child who also feels anxious, I think I'm hurt, and maybe starts to cry or have a big reaction, right? But if you assure that child, oh, you're fine, you're okay, we're just gonna dust ourselves off, then usually that child will go, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. So it's really important to understand that from in utero to throughout their childhood, that you are often their North Star, that, you're, that they often are attuning to whatever your stress levels are, right? <laughs> so that if you answer or respond to their stress with more of your stress, it's only going to exacerbate the situation. So we really want to be mindful of just being calm when we see our kids experiencing high levels of stress, that we want to share our calm and not bring more chaos, right? We want to use coping skills to calm ourselves. We can model for our students or for our children that yeah, I get stressed out too sometimes. Can I teach you some of my tips and tricks for calming myself? Can I share, share with you that, yeah, life is, is hectic sometimes, but here's how we have to remind ourselves to be calm. I also want to remind us all that usually anxiety is an anticipation of a future that's never happened, right? We'll talk more about that when we get to resetting ourselves. But usually it's a fear of something that has yet to happen when we're thinking about anxiety. So watch your response to the news and your own media consumption. These last couple of years have been really brutal with the news. I wouldn't even say last couple, I'd say like the last decade. Um, I recall my son is now a freshman at Westchester University, so I'm going back to like Sandy Hook. I'm thinking that was around like 11, 10, somebody, I don't know if someone can remind me. And shortly after that school shooting, I was just in the kitchen with my, with my son, we're making lunches and doing you know the things to get ready for the beginning of the day. I didn't even realize the TV was on with Sandy Hook coverage. And I look over at the table and I could see my son was just sitting there crying. Just crying, just hearing this first thing in the morning as we got our lunches together. And he started asking me questions like, you know, where will I hide if they come for me? 
And think about, that's just one of the many school shootings or all kinds of things that kids have been privy to hearing on the news. Uh, politics has been at all time high. Uh, there's just so many bad news stories that have been out there that kids are overhearing. They're hearing our reaction to the news. Um, I had to make a decision shortly after that Sandy Hook incident with my child that I wasn't even gonna watch local news anymore. I, I would watch local news for something very specific. <laughs> I can look up the weather and all that on my phone. If it's really important, I will see it on my phone. But I think the local news in particular was really scary because I may have just been at that place <coughs> a couple days ago and now you're telling me this big cat catastrophic event happened or I'm planning to be there next week. Kids know this as well. Sometimes just hearing the news on in the background, if that's part of the practice, like I know when I was a, a child, my Nana just loved to have the news on all the time. It was just on all the time, just white noise in the background. <laughs> Can be very stressful <laughs> if you have the news on nonstop, because guess what? It's rarely good news. <laughs> it's rarely anything wonderful. I can't remember the last time I turned on the news and saw kittens playing with yarn, and <laughs> something fun, right? It's usually terrible news. So we just have to be really careful about what we're consuming, what our kids are consuming by being in close proximity to what we have on. Um, and then let children talk about their feelings, help reframe their concerns into an appropriate perspective. So a lot of times we'll hear kids um, maybe, or we perceive maybe that they're worried about something, um, and maybe it's something really big we're not ready to talk about yet. So we avoid the subject. Well, oftentimes by avoiding the topic, it makes it seem even scarier, even bigger, something that I should really be worried about. So a lot of times we take the, uh, the fear, the sting out of that topic when we do address it. And I wouldn't go, um, I wouldn't allow the child's questions, depending on their age, to lead the discussion. Sometimes we give a little too less information, a little more, you know, less information than they, than they probably could use, and sometimes we give a little too much. So let the discussion be led by the child's questions. So number two, you want to lay a foundation. Keep talking. Let them know that the lines of communication will be open. One thing I'm really proud of that I did, a very conscious decision I made with my son, who's now 18, is that we were going to talk about everything. We were going to talk about everything. Nothing was off limits. And because of that, um, and people thought that was weird when he was little, like, wow, you talk about it. We talk about everything, anything he wants to know about. Um, because now at 18, I'm really proud to say that he comes home from college and still wants to talk to me. <laughs> he still wants to tell me about what's going on in his day and what, how he's moving through life. And I said, you know, give, just give me a day in the life of your college day. And he really went through a day in the life and the nuances. And that kind of relationship is created when there's trust and safety and that I know it's okay to talk about these things. So you really want to make sure that you're creating and fostering, nurturing and cultivating an environment in your home where it's okay to talk about these things. And when I say these things, that's a really a very broad spectrum of, of things that could be, but whatever in your particular situation may be a source of worry and stress for your child. Whether that's their grades, whether that's their social scene, maybe that's their sexual gender or orientation, um, maybe that has to do with you know academics, whatever it is the source or sources of their anxiety. So invite children to talk about the issue, find out what they already know and what they're learning. Find out, uh, remember that not talking about something can increase worry. Don't minimize or avoid concerns. Listen and let them know it's okay to be scared or worried. <coughs> this is really important. We do want to be able to validate the feeling. That doesn't mean that we're validating the worry, if that makes sense. So we want to validate our child's concerns. I see that you're really worried about this. I can see how concerned you are about this. But that doesn't mean that we're validating that their concern is as big as they think it is, right? But we still want to acknowledge and let them know that it's okay to have these fears and worries, that that makes you human. That just makes you human. So it's okay to say, even though we don't have answers to everything right now, know that once we know, we'll let you know, right? It's okay to keep a child up to date and say, this is, this is all we know for now, but we're gonna do our best to make it okay for you. Tip number three, be honest and accurate. This is really important. As we talked about in the last piece here, that this open conversation and dialogue with your kids is so important. That's gonna be very difficult for kids to have with you if we shy away from things, if we omit things in certain topics, 
be honest. Be honest. And you will have kids who now feel that through that vulnerability that there is trust here that I can share and talk about the things I need to talk about. Um, don't be afraid to discuss difficult topics. They're only as difficult as we make them. I think just the same as kids have excessive worry and fear, sometimes we do too. We build things up to be much bigger in our minds than they actually are. Uh, I heard a great quote once, um, what is it, boogeymen hide in the dark. When we turn on the light, they're not as scary. Secrets hide in the dark, right? So we can talk about difficult topics with our kids. Give children the facts as you know them. Talk about what all of this means and let children know your thoughts on the situation and how you're coping. Tip number four, be reassuring. If true, emphasize to children that they are safe and that there are precautions taken to keep them safe. Remind children that the adults are there to keep them safe. So, you know, for some, time, for some kids, part of their worry is just going to school. There are so many things that happen at the school throughout the day, whether that be academic concerns about their readiness or being prepared or perfection. And by the way, perfectionism is a part of the, um, the, the is it freeze response. So that is part of the stress response. If you have a child who is like waiting for perfect, it has to be perfect, that is an indicator that they're in their stress response. Of course, we all want to get it right, but failure is a part of life. I have a great mantra if you're interested. Um, Nelson Mandela famously said, I never lose, either I win or I learn, which effectively eliminates the possibility of failure. And for so many of us, our failure, isn't that going good, right? And for so many of us, that's the, well, I found too that fear can be paralyzing both ways. I used to be, I used to think that I was afraid of failure and then come to find out, I think I was afraid of success. Right? I think that's true for a lot of our kids too. Well, what if they want more? What if I don't have to give? What if this well runs dry? What if this is the last great thing I ever do? So that can also go both ways. We can have a fear of our failure as well as our fear of success. And either way, it can be very paralyzing. So let's talk through these things. Um, tip number five, create a plan for safety. Kids feel empowered when they know what to do to keep themselves safe. Focus on what you're doing to stay safe and emphasize precautions you're taking. So this could be, you know, for a couple of different things. A lot of this was COVID precautions, right? There were a lot of kids who were super stressed out, especially if you lived in a multi-generational home. Will I be the, the outbreak monkey, right, that brings home this illness and kills my family? Um, yeah, many of us probably felt that if we had to go to work and be out in the public or if we work in healthcare. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's important to talk about what precautions we can take, whether or not that be COVID-19 or some other, um, you know, issue that requires precautions to be made. Review, you know, the model uh, basic hygiene, basic hand washing, mask wearing, and other safety precautions. If you know, I can't, as much as I like to think that COVID is behind us, I keep getting reminded that it's not quite, quite, quite behind us yet. But we will get there. So tip number six: avoid blame and look out for stigma. What do I mean by that? We want to avoid stereotyping and identifying someone to blame. Sometimes it's just easier for us, right? If there's a culprit, <laughs> someone to direct our energies at. But sometimes life just happens. You know, illnesses happen, cancer happens, uh, things just happen. And so we want to make kids aware that that's just part of life. Things do happen, it's not always someone's fault. We don't always have to have a red herring or someone to blame. <coughs> Explaining that things like virus and other news events, COVID-19, have nothing to do with how someone looks or what language they speak. Um, this was another big thing, you know, during the height of uh, HIV and AIDS epidemic back in the 80s and 90s. So if it's a fear of germs, which could be very prevalent right now as well with all the different illnesses that have gone around the last couple of years, remind us, we want to remind kids that it's not based on any of those things that we're all just equally susceptible. Be aware of any bullying or negative comments and encourage your children to spread kindness and support because we are all in this together. I was reminded recently by a good friend of mine, um, I was sharing this, we have a podcast now for the ESS, I was sharing this story on the podcast, I don't know if you heard it yet, Deanne, but one of my very best friends, Tracy, uh, I, was, I was a little upset with her because she said, 
uh, or because I thought she hadn't really been there for me in this moment that I needed her. And I said, you know, where were you? I needed you at this time. She said, you know, I am so sorry. Do you know who else was going through something? I was like, who? She's like, literally everyone. <laughs> everyone is going through something. So remind ourselves of that when we're even at the gas station, when we're, uh, you know, I, I was at like a Dunkin' Donuts not long ago and they completely destroyed my order. And I'm like, you know what? We're all going through stuff. <laughs> Let's not, let me not freak out about this. We're all having a day, we're all having a moment. And so whether it's our child showing anxiety, um, stress and worry, or someone else's child, or our neighbor, uh, let's just be kind with each other. Let's just be patient. You never know what is really going on for that person. So um, number seven, stick to routines. Routines are really, really wonderful um, just in general, right? And especially if someone has excessive worry tendencies or anxiety because my routines keep me safe. Um, think about for even for us, for most of us, do you all have, um, you know, um, do you tend to look at your calendars first thing in the morning? Like I check my calendar at night and I check my calendar first thing in the morning. Why? Because I'm trying to prepare myself for the day. I need to make sure that I'm dressed in the right things so that I can accomplish all of the things on my to-do list that day. I want to just schedule out my day so that I know how to coordinate stuff and, and, and kids are no different. When I was a young mom, I remember having my kid in the back seat and staring at me at the rear view mirror and I remember this was that time when you're like, wow, I'm actually having a real conversation back and forth with my kid. Like there's an exchange of ideas here when you realize you're actually conversing with your child. And my kid always wanted to know, where are we going today, mom? What's the plan? And you know, I might've said, we're going to the bank, we're going to the grocery store, going wherever. And if I went out of order, he was like, you said that we were going here first, but you said. Has anyone ever heard the, but you said line from our kids? Because we may have gone out of order. I can tell you, having been a teacher for many years and observing teacher and student interactions, when the day is different than it usually is, there are some, some definitely both adults and kids who are very uh, out of sorts, <laughs> right? That we depend on our routines. I like to know what happens next. This is why our little kids watch the same movie over and over again. This is why they know every word to Moana and Frozen and whatever. I like to be able to predict what they're going to say before they say it. This is why kids don't want you to read a different bedtime story. I want that other one again and again. I like to be able to predict everything that's gonna happen. It makes me feel safe, makes me feel in charge, makes me feel in control. <coughs> and a lot of our excessive worry and anxiety is this feeling of I have no control. I'm helpless. This world is happening around me and I'm helpless. So that really, the more you can create routines, establish routines, and when, you know, life happens, when we get thrown off of those routines, if we can try to let our kids know as soon as possible, hey, there's gonna be a change, but it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I think that we wanna get into the habit of not necessarily removing the things that cause our child anxiety, but helping them cope with it. Right? The more that we are just removing the things that cause anxiety, they're learning that the coping skill is as much as I complain about it or if I develop a behavior around this, then I won't have to engage with this thing that gives me anxiety so much. So the goal is to help them tolerate this anxiety, to realize it's not as big a threat as I think it is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in resetting. Um, so don't push children if they seem overwhelmed. Remembering that if you're in that stress response, your fight, flight, or freeze, adrenaline and cortisol levels are high. That means that your child is often stuck then in their primitive brain, the smallest part of their brain, the most primitive, the least likely to be able to make sense for reasoning, judgment, uh, problem solving, is out the window. When I showed that triune brain theory, when you are in experiencing your, those high levels of cortisol and adrenaline, there's like a trap door that comes down that separates you from the higher level part of the higher level thinking part of your brain. So you're not seeing your child show up in those moments, you're seeing their <coughs> stress response representative. And it's not until they are calm that you can have reason with them, that you can talk through the problem. So it really becomes an effort of how can I give you some calm at this moment before we can even try to parse through whatever's going on. I first need to bring you calm. So discuss the new rules at school and how they will change as circumstances change. And this is not just at school. This is at home too. Our rules change at home. I, was, I do some private consulting with a lot of families. And 
the last couple of years, I've had a lot of families come to me and say, my kid is playing video games all night long. I don't know what to do. And so I like to make it so that it's not a punishment when you have to change your rules around video games, but we're just stating it as these are rules to keep us safe. Um, so that now we're not saying in the middle of the, you know, middle of the night at three in the morning, I'm tired of this stuff with this video games, it's over. You're never allowed to play this again. Or, you know, there's some you know, big punitive moment. More so that the next day, hey, I'm so glad you're home from school. Did you have a good day? I need to make you wear some new rules that we have in our home. These rules are to keep us safe. No one's in trouble. No one's a bad kid. This isn't punitive. These are just some rules that I'm setting up in our home to keep us safe. And when it's presented that way, rather than something that is punitive, you're gonna get a lot more compliance, or should I say cooperation, with our kids, even if they're rules that they don't particularly like, they know that this is a rule, this is not a punishment, and that, that plays very differently. So um, tip number eight, be developmentally appropriate. So we just talked about those different stages and what stress and anxiety may, how it may manifest whether that's preschool, elementary, that middle school, high school. So make sure that you're developmentally appropriate when addressing these situations. Um, let your children's questions be the guide to how much information you provide. Again, you don't wanna over provide information and then now they're left with a bunch of other swirling questions. <laughs> like I didn't even think about that one. Let their questions guide the conversation. And then early elementary school children need brief, Simple information, usually very concrete, <clears throat> may be hard for kids in the elementary ages to understand a lot of gray area, but when we can try to be as concrete as we can and just say there's some things we don't know yet, but as soon as we do know, you'll be the first to know. Um, upper elementary and early middle school children will be more vocal in asking questions, <clears throat> hopefully. Uh, some of our kids come home and say nothing, <laughs> right? And so we kind of have to not pry, but be curious. No, I mean, can, maybe if I ask more specific questions. How is this experience for you? What's it like in the cafeteria? You know, do the smells or something bother you in this particular area? Remember, our sensory system can also trigger our stress response. Things that are unpleasant smelling to us or when it's too loud in an area can cause anxiety and stress for us. So let's be curious, ask questions about some of these different experiences that our kids endure, how friendships are going. A lot of times, uh, you know, our friends are fluctuating at this time of our life, you know, whether it be in element, maybe your best friends with someone all through elementary and you get to middle school and they don't want to be your friend anymore. Maybe, um, you know, there's some high school type drama with friends and things. So ask pointed questions, you know, be curious, not in a judgmental way. I see you smiling. Did you want to say something? Did you want to? <laughs> okay. It seemed like that one was something, sparked something for you. Um, but yeah, there can be so many different nuanced things that we might not even think about, right? If you're starting to notice that kids are shying away from certain events or activities, let's ask questions about them. Let's not come at them with you know, any harsh kind of talk, but be curious about, I'm noticing you're not interested in doing the things that you used to really like. What's going on there? What's, what's going on? Tell me about it. Let's just talk about it some. And then upper middle school and high school students can discuss the issue in way more depth. But we still have to create that foundation of safety to have these type of conversations. Kids need to know that I'm not gonna be in trouble if I have these thoughts or if I need to share something with you about what's going on, that you'll talk it through with me, that you won't judge me. And then helping children cope. So then now we're gonna go back through those age ranges. How am I doing on time, by the way? Great. Oh, perfect, okay. So then we've got helping children cope. So we've got now that preschool age, Patience and tolerance. Remember, if we refer back to our last chart, we had tantrums there, bedwetting, as symptoms of, of stress and worry. So if you're coming in, if you have a child who's at this age and you come into the room in the middle of the night and the bed is wet, this isn't probably the best time to go, what, how could you be, you know better than this? How long have you been potty trained? What is going on here? And understand this was not a conscious choice. This is a symptom of a bigger problem. And by having a big reaction to this can often create more fear and anxiety for this child. So provide reassurance and verbal and physical. Hey, it's okay, these things happen sometimes. What's going on? Is there anything that you wanna talk about? And remembering first that we have to get them calm. They may be very upset if they've just wet the bed or waking up in the middle of the night. That we wanna use our calming strategies before we can even start to have conversations about this. They may even be better to wait till the next day. Allow short-term changes in sleep arrangements. 
Encourage families to plan calming, comforting activities before bedtime. Uh, one of the things I used to love to do in my household that I recommended was turning off lights, having softer lights on before bedtime, getting us in that cozy mood. If you have, again, routines, then maybe there's a bedtime routine that you have. Whether it's a small child or even for older kids, there's still, I have my own bedtime routine now, I'm in my 40s, so, you know, keeping those routines that kind of tell our body when it's time to do this or that. So, um, encourage regular family routines and avoid that media exposure, particularly before bed, right? We're even saying now that kids shouldn't be on devices at least an hour before bed. It's very stimulating, can keep us up worrying <laughs> and, you know, uh, catastrophizing. So try to avoid any tablets, uh, video games, phones, at least an hour before bed. So then now as you move into school age, ages 6 to 12, we're still going to be really patient and tolerant. We want to be reassuring that when we see some of these behaviors, again, I want to recognize them as this is my child in their stress response. This is not necessarily my child just being overtly defiant. There is a reason for this behavior. Let me be more curious, be more patient as I discover what this is. Regular exercise and stretching, so important for all of our mental health. I think we all know that even just taking a walk, you know, on a daily basis can do wonders for our mental health. I discovered that during the pandemic, that just a daily walk would turn my whole world around. So really encouraging either a family walk, especially as the weather gets nicer in the spring, um, but doing things together that keep us active. Um, and now I'm not saying you guys need to be running marathons together, but doing something that just gets us moving, right? That gets the blood flowing, um, and that's always gonna do wonders for our mental health, particularly when we can make that a family, kind of a communal situation. So then encourage children to participate in structured household chores. Again, that's part of the routines of your home. As we talked about the importance of routines and predictability, if you have solid routines in your home for how kids are supposed to uh, handle chores and knock out tasks and responsibilities around the home, that will really help. Encourage expression through play and conversation. Help family create ideas for enhancing health promotion behaviors and maintaining family routines. And again, limit that media exposure. This is going to be carried throughout all the ages, you'll see. And then adolescents ages 13 to 18. Again, more patience, tolerance. You may see a theme here <laughs> developing. The patience and tolerance is so critical for anxiety. Um, and then encouraging continuation of routines. Encourage discussion of pandemic experience with peers. And this is just an example. Whatever it is is the source of your child's anxiety in, in that case. Encourage staying in touch with friends through telephone, internet, video games, safely getting together. Encourage participating in family routines, chores, all these things still will apply to your older kids. Conversation becomes more important here. Really just discussing, sharing, talking, spending time together. <clears throat> so now supporting children with existing mental health challenges. So be a role model. Take breaks, get plenty of sleep. All of those things that are good for our mental health, we've got to model that for our kids. We've got to show them good routines. We've got to show them that we take our sleep seriously that we are you know, trying to do things to eat well and keep our bodies feeling good. We have to model those types of best mental health practices so that our kids will pick up those best mental health practices, particularly if they've already been diagnosed with some other type of mental health issue. Then we know how important their mental health will be as they continue to age throughout life. And so <coughs> building these best practices now and having you model them will be paramount to their success. I'm gonna give you some tips on how to do that as well in a minute. So then remind children to separate what is in their control from what is not. Uh, I love uh, my other mantra is the serenity prayer you may be familiar with. Uh, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And you know, whatever profession you're in, I say this to teachers all the time, but whatever profession you are in, whatever personal things you're going through, that is a wonderful um, uh, kind of prayer to kind of get us through. There's no use worrying about things that we have no control over, but let me really put the focus on the things that I can control, like self-care and my own mental health. And I know I have to do these things to be well. Um, we want to help them create plans to do what helps them feel a sense of safety. Challenge yourself to stay in the present. So again, I'm 
I don't want to bury the lead, we're going to talk about mindfulness in a minute, but again, anxiety tends to be when we're living in the future, when we're anticipating a future that hasn't happened yet. And we're the happiest when we remain present. When we are here, the here and now is when we are the most content in life. When we're thinking about the past, which we can't do anything about, cannot go back in the DeLorean with Doc and Marty, and oftentimes we're worrying about a, pa a future that it hasn't even come to fruition yet, or that may never, right? So we really want to focus on being present. And what does that look like? And a lot of times we may not realize how disconnected we are when we're in our own anxious thoughts or planning in our day or thinking about something a month from now or weeks from now as our kids may be trying to interact with us and they can see the, the distraction that we're mentally somewhere else. So we have got to be good stewards uh, and practice role model being as present as much as possible. Now it's part of the human experience to do those things, by the way. The goal here is to realize it and to reset ourselves. So help children connect with others. Have children talk to people that they trust about their concerns and how they're feeling. Connect with school resources. If you're noticing a persistent, excessive worry and anxiety in your, in your, in your kids, not only do you want to get school involved, but you may want to seek additional men, uh, mental health help. I hope that you know, presentations like this help to destigmatize getting help that way. Because mental health, uh, particularly anxiety, as I said, is on the rise. It is super common, very prevalent. Um, even if it's not a condition, we all experience anxiety from time to time. It may just be short-term or really tolerable stress, but we all experience it. So that should you know, take any uniqueness out of, of having anxiety and destigmatize that, make it really okay for kids to seek help, that that's nor normal and that we should you know, encourage that. So for children with existing mental health challenges, practice asking the following questions. Are you okay? Do you need help? How are you managing? If you are concerned about safety, are you thinking of killing yourself? Now that sounds very jarring, me making that statement. But I'll tell you that uh, when someone really is at risk of taking their life, you'd wish you asked that pointed question. And not the, you know, the kind of the, the back door way, like are you thinking of hurting yourself? Are you thinking of killing yourself? A lot of people who have attempted suicide and been unsuccessful have said that if someone had asked me that I would maybe have talked about it. If someone had asked me that specific question. Um, you know, or or are, you, are you thinking about suicide is another way. But to be very direct, let's not beat around the bush. There's a lot at stake here. Ask the direct question. So then now resetting. We've just talked about a lot of really heavy stuff, right? And our, our uh, adrenaline and cortisol flooding our system and how it impacts us in a variety of ways. And that can be very daunting, all of that. So let's talk about ways that we can really cope with that. What do we do when we are feeling overwhelmed by these big emotions? So first I'm gonna define mindfulness. So mindfulness is the practice of bringing your full awareness of the present rather than thinking about the past or the future. It's living in the moment without judgment. So one of the most important components of mindfulness is not only awareness, but an attitude of acceptance and curiosity towards your thoughts and emotions. So that means that um, I can you know, see what my thoughts are and I'm not judging my thoughts. So it's a wonderful thing when you can get to that place. One way that I like to think about it is uh, you guys all live near the shore, right? And so when you're at the shore and you see those planes fly over that say like, you know, come to Moe's Bar this, you know, tonight for, uh, you know, what is it, a couple of dollars for rolling rocks and oysters or whatever it is, right? And you kind of see it, you're on the beach, right? And you kind of see it coming in and then you read it and just like that it sort of disappears, right? Well, you can imagine your thoughts that way. As these thoughts come up, I acknowledge it and I let it pass. I acknowledge it and I let it pass. I'm not going to ruminate or perseverate and hammer that problem out. But I'm going to acknowledge it. And then through that acknowledgement, I can sometimes be curious. Well, what is that coming up in me for? What does that mean? What is that telling me? So by recognizing these feelings for what they are and accepting them, you can better overcome psychological distress. Anyone from children to adults can find a greater peace of mind through mindfulness techniques. So the science behind mindfulness, by the way, the science is like 5,000 years old, maybe longer, um, but never too late, right? <laughs> never too late. 
So according to the Brain Imaging Report, practicing mindfulness can alter the structure of your brain in a way that improves your reaction to stress. People who practice mindfulness often have increased blood flow to their brain and a thickened cerebral cortex. These changes are associated with a stronger attention span and ability to regulate and navigate intense emotions. So what does that mean? That's kind of some fancy language. We want to create this nice gray dense matter around that hippocampus that we talked about earlier, that amygdala. And what that does is the, the stressors in life that come up, the things that cause us to worry and be stressed about, will still happen. But our reaction to them will be different. We will now have a response rather than a stimulated reaction. There's that space where we can kind of examine, is this how I want to proceed? Do I need to take a moment for myself? A moment to get present? So research finds that youth who practice mindfulness develop more patience, better focus and productivity, increased compassion, heightened body awareness, less stress and anxiety overall. Uh, this is true for all of us, but particularly in growing children. One of the things that we need to remember is that all of this adrenaline and cortisol can have really disastrous consequences for brain development. Um, as we think about ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, oftentimes if these things don't get addressed, um, they turn into really bad long-term long, long -term healthcare outcomes, right? Uh, so really by practicing mindfulness, these things are essential to just living a healthy, normal life, right? I need to be patient. I need to have better focus and be productive. Increased compassion leads to a lot less bullying, right? And don't we want our kids to feel compassion and empathy for their peers um, and for each other, right? Heightened body awareness, you become, remember we talked about the different physiological changes that are happening during these times of stress. My heartbeat, I'm paying attention now to what my body feels like, to if I have that lump in my throat, to if I'm speaking really fast right now, are my hands clammy, am I sweating all of a sudden? When you're starting to pay more attention to your body to bring awareness, you suddenly are, are recognizing all of these different symptoms that are taking place. And once you recognize them, now you can make a change. But as I think Dr. Phil famously says, we can't change what we don't acknowledge. Until I'm aware of these things, it's really hard to make changes. So uh, mindfulness is awareness cultivated through meditation and other mind-body practices to regulate and shape our attention and emotion. So as I was saying, well, normally we have this stimulus, the thing that's causing us this worry and anxiety, and we react. We react in that fight, flight, or freeze. But when we are practicing mindfulness, it's not an overnight thing, but over time, we'll see that stimulus that would normally cause us to go right into that reaction phase, and now there's a little time for me to go, you know what, I'm gonna have to reset that. This isn't good for me, that doesn't feel good in my body. I have an awareness that I'm feeling some changes happen in my body, and I don't like that, and I have the power to change it. So we wanna reset and renew. Oh. So when you think about resetting and what that means, we want to, you know, we talked a lot about cortisol and adrenaline. We want to talk about our happiness hormones. We want to talk about uh, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. And one of the best things that you can do for your kids is to hack oxytocin as often as you can. Is anyone familiar with the happy chemical oxytocin and what that does for us? So oxytocin is it, naturally created in the brain and it is very necessary for that hippocampus to grow for learning and memory. And one of the best ways to have oxytocin produced is by giving our kids hugs, by being affectionate, by giving true meaningful compliments and recognitions. And that creates oxytocin not just for our child, but for us as well. I often talk about hugs in my trainings, where I'll say, you know, we, we, there's a couple different hugs in our society, right? You'll give a hug where you sort of do this, oh, it's so good to see you, I'm so happy, so, oh, great. And then we kind of give more of a, you know, a real hug sometimes where it's like, oh, that's good, maybe our bodies touch a little bit, and then we kind of back away. I think guys will give that kind of shug, right, where they do the handshake and bring it in a little bit. You're like, oh, it's so good, man, so good. Maybe we'll give a little on the back, too, at the same time. And then once in a while, you have somebody who surprises you with one of those hugs that you weren't ready for, you weren't expecting. You ever go in for the hug and you think it's gonna be, oh, and they're like, you couldn't hear, you couldn't. You're like, oh, I didn't know what's happening. I didn't, oh, but you know what? This feels kind of good. <laughs> and after a few seconds, you settle into that hug and you go, wow, I didn't know 
I needed a hug like this. And you may ask yourself, when is the last time anyone gave me a hug like It could have been weeks ago since I've had a really good hug like this. And if you're very fortunate, you have an auntie like mine who only gives those legitimate hugs. She's like, if it's not a real hug, I don't even want it. So hopefully you all have someone like that in your life. If you grew up in a, in a family that's not very affectionate, that's okay. When we know better, we can do better. But just know that that oxytocin creates so much happiness chemicals in your child, just having that affection. Um, if you have a child that is already just not that affectionate, you know, you can take it at a snail's pace. Maybe just use some of your verbal recognitions to create that bond, that oxytocin, um, which is so, so helpful for managing stress and anxiety. Dopamine, well, you know what, I'll just go to the stress chemicals, I mean, happiness chemicals. This is clearly not an exhaustive list, but this is a great starter kit to get you thinking about what would help me reset in these big moments. How could I hack one of these chemicals? Sometimes just completing a task. Um, I notice that when I'm stressed out, I will start to clean. All of a sudden, I never want to do dishes. Suddenly, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to clean these dishes. Why? Because I can step back from that in a few minutes and go, look what I just accomplished. I banged out a goal. The kitchen is clean. Mr. Mr. Clean's winking at me, smiling at the ding, right? And it makes us feel good that I was able to accomplish something. Cleaning out a drawer real fast. Putting all your clothes from the, you know, the laundry basket in your closet. Doing those simple tasks make us feel good again, right? Um, you know, just having a piece of dark chocolate, not milk chocolate. It must be that bitter dark chocolate that will grow on you. <laughs> Can do a whole lot for that serotonin mood booster. Taking a walk, uh, playing with your family pet. This is another great way to get the oxytocin. Endorphins, so one of my best ways to get endorphins is laughter. Fortunately, I grew up in a home with a lot of laughter. Everyone's a comedian in my family. But um, when I'm on my own, I have a little playlist on YouTube with like my favorite Key and Peele sketch, sketches or the things that I know will get me to laugh in like 30 seconds. That It's not a big build up, I need this laughter right away. <laughs> so make yourself a playlist or help make your kids one. That'll make them laugh, <coughs> release those endorphins. When's the last time you had a good belly laugh? Like where you were falling out the chair crying. Hopefully you got to see some family over the holidays and got to experience something like that. It makes us feel so good. It makes all those worries and things just not seem nearly as important. In my family, we have a tradition of playing Millborn. Anyone familiar with the game Millborn? Uh, it's oh, isn't it so fun? The rest of you don't know what you're doing with your lives. You need to get Millborn. It's a great family fun game. It's like a four player game. Uh, it stands for 1,000 miles. Millborn is a French game. Everybody starts off with their own race car. It's kind of like Uno, but everyone has a race car. And you're trying to get to 1,000 miles first. And other people will try to get in your way and give you a you know, flat tire, <laughs> put you on a speed limit. But anyway, my point is it makes for great family fun. You want to have these moments in your family where we're not stressed out, we're not worried about this or that, but we're just having fun in this moment. We're playing games. We're doing things together. You need to bring that kind of atmosphere to your home. will significantly reduce that type of anxiety, stress, and worry, that pent up stuff that's going on. Have fun together. Watch a comedy. Exercise together. Take a walk in nature. Remember happy times. Look through photo albums of really fun family vacations and things that you've done together. All of these things will really go a long way towards uh, you know, relieving some of that stress and anxiety that our kids feel. So some of those recent examples, and this is not an exhaustive list, music. One of the things that I can recall in my house growing up is that every Saturday morning we woke up to music. My mom was blasting music first thing, and that, that was really the cue for get your cleaning stuff out, we're cleaning this morning. Um, but we're gonna do it to some good music. And so music, whether that's you know, just having a little speaker in your kid's bedroom for them to listen to music, having nice headphones or something, but just having music in the household. If you're a musical family and people play instruments, do that. Um, but music can be a wonderful reset. Exercise, jumping jacks, muscle relaxation, mindful coloring. Um, so anything that is sensory, having a moment where you just have a moment of gratitude. I like to start my day like this. Because I, I will find quickly my anxiety will spiral out of control early in the morning if I don't start my day with some gratitude. If I wake up, I like to have first a warm beverage, and during that warm beverage, as my mind will start to go, oh my God, you know, you have this to do today, and you have that to do, you have a lot of balls in the air, lady, don't drop them. And as my mind starts to spiral out of control, believe me, our kids do the same thing. They think about all the balls they have in the air that day as well. So rather than my mind go there, 
I like to think about three things I'm really grateful for. And usually those three things turn into five things, which turn into 10 things, to which my cup runneth over with gratitude. And it's really a much better way to start my day thinking about all the things I really have to be grateful for. Um, gardening is a great one too, especially if you can do family gardening. Stretch break, body scan, Simon says, listening to a short story, freeze dance party in your house. Make things fun, breath work. So finally, your resources, and these are in your packet as well, but these are just some hotline numbers. If you find you have any acute issues that need to be addressed um, and you need emergency help. And I love this quote. Hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear. If we believe that tomorrow will be better, we can bear a hardship today. So hopefully you all will take this little survey for me. You should have it in your handout as well as up here. You, it's just a QR code like they do in restaurants nowadays, so you can just uh, you know, put that on your phone and I'd love to get any feedback that you have so that we can make these presentations even better in the future. I wanna thank you again for coming this, this evening. I hope that you got something out of this, had some tips, some takeaways, and uh, I know it's time, but I will be here for a little while if anyone wants to talk you know, privately or in smaller groups or has any questions. But thank you so much for being here and being such a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.